the first generation of men in Egypt, contemplating the beauty of the superior world, admiring with astonishment the frame and order of the universe, suppose there were two chief gods that were eternal, that is to say, the sun and the moon, the first which they call Osiris, and the other Isis, both names having proper etymologies, for Osiris in the Greek language signifies a thing with many eyes, which may be properly applied to the sun, darting his rays into every corner. And as it were, with so many eyes, viewing and surveying the whole land and sea, in which agrees the poet, the sun from the lofty sphere, all sees, all hear. Some, also the ancient Greek mythologists, say Osiris is Dionysus, and surname him Sirius, among Eumolpus and his Bacchanal verses, Dionysus darts his fiery rays, and Orpheus the bard calls Thanates and Dionysus. Some, likewise, set him forth clothed with the spotted skin of a fawn called Nebris. From the variety of stars that surround him, Isis likewise being interpreted signifies ancient. That name being ascribed to the moon from the internal generations. They add likewise to her horns because her aspect is such an increase and in her decrease representing a sickle. And because an ox among the Egyptians is offered into her sacrifice, they hold that these gods govern the whole world, cherishing and increasing all things, and divide the year into three parts, that is to say, spring, summer, and winter, by an invisible motion, perfecting their constant course in that time, and thought they are in their very natures, very differing one from another, yet they complete the whole year with the most excellent harmony consent. They say that these gods and their natures do contribute much to the generation of all things, the one being a hot and active nature, the other moist and cold, but both having something of the air and that by these all things are both brought forth and nourished, and therefore that every particular being in the universe is perfected and completed by the sun and the moon, whose qualities, as before declared, are five, a spirit or quickening efficiency, heat or fire, dryness or earth, moisture or water, and air, in which the world does consist as man made up of head, hands, feet, and other parts. These five are reputed for gods, and the people of Egypt, who were the first that spoke articulately, gave names proper to their several natures, according to the language that they spake, and therefore they call the spirit Jupiter, which is such interpretation, because a quickening influence is derived from this into all living creatures. as from the original principle, and upon that account he is esteemed the common parent of all things. And to this most famous poet of the Greeks gives testimony or speaking of this God, he says, of men and gods the father. Fire they call interpretation Vulcan, and him they had a veneration as a great God, as he that greatly contributed to the generation and perfection of all beings whatsoever. The earth as the common womb of all production, they call Matera, as the Greeks in process of time, by a small alteration of one letter and the emission of two letters, called the earth Demetra, which was very anciently called Gen Matera, or Mother Earth, as Orpheus attests in this verse, the Mother Earth, Demeter, also called, 
brings forth most richly water or moisture the ancients called oceanus which by interpretation is a nourishing mother and so taken by the Grecians, of which the poet says thus the father of the gods the ocean is tethys the mother called but the egyptians account their nile to be oceanus of which all the gods were born for in egypt among all countries in the world are many cities built by the ancient gods as by jupiter sol mercury apollo pan Elithia, and many others. To the air, they gave the name Minerva, signifying something proper to the nature thereof, and called her the daughter of Jupiter, and counted a virgin, because the air naturally is not subject to corruption, and is the highest part of the universe. Whence rises the fable that she was the issue of Jupiter's brain. They say she is called also Tritogenus, or thrice begotten because she changes her natural qualities thrice in a year the spring summer and winter and that she was called glaucopis not that she has gray eyes as some of the greeks have supposed for that is a weak conceit but because the air seems to be of a gray color to the view They report likewise that these five gods travel through the whole world, representing themselves to men sometimes in the shapes of sacred living creatures, and sometimes in the form of men, or some other representation. And this is not a fable, but very possible. If it be true that these generate all things, and the poet who traveled into Egypt in some parts of his works affirms this appearance to be learnt, from the priest the gods also like strangers come from far in diverse shapes within towns appear viewing men's good and wicked acts and these are the stories told by the egyptians of the heavenly immortal gods and besides these they say there are others that are terrestrial which were begotten of the former gods and were originally mortal then, but by reason of their wisdom to all mankind, have obtained immortality, of which some have been kings of Egypt, some of whom, by interpretation, have had the same names with the celestial gods. Others have kept their own proper names, for they report that Sol, Saturn, Rhea, Jupiter, also known as Amon, Juno, Vulcan, Vesta, and lastly, Mercury, who is called Thoth, reigned in Egypt, and the soul was the first king of Egypt, whose name was the same with the celestial planet called Sol, with the priesthood in Heliopolis. But there are some of the priests who affirm Vulcan to be the first of their gods and that he was advanced to all dignity upon account of being the first that used fire which was so beneficial to all mankind for a tree in the mountain happening to be set on fire by lightning the wood next adjoining was presently all in a flame and Vulcan thereupon coming to that place was mightily refreshed by the heat of it being then winter season. And when the fire began to fail, he added more combustible matter to it, and by that means preserving it, calling it other men to enjoy the benefit of that which he himself was the first inventor, as he gave out. Afterwards, they say Saturn reigned and married his sister Rhea, and that he begat of her Osiris and Isis, but others say Jupiter and Juno, who for their great virtues ruled all over the world, that if Jupiter and Juno were born five gods, one upon every day of the five Egyptian intercalary days, the names of these gods 
Osiris, Isis, Typhon, Apollo, and Venus. That Osiris was interpreted Bacchus, and Isis plainly Ceres. That Osiris married Isis, and after he came to the kingdom, did much and performed many things for the common benefit and advantage of mankind. For he was the first that forbade men eating one another. And at the same time, Isis found out the way of making bread and wheat and barley, which before grew here and there in the fields amongst the other herbs and grasses, and the use of it unknown, and Osiris teaching the way and manner of tillage and well management of the fruits of the earth. This change of food became grateful, both because it was naturally sweet and delicious, and the men were thereby restrained from the mutual butcheries of one another. For an evidence of this first finding out the use of these fruits, they allege an ancient custom among them. For even this day, in the time of harvest, the inhabitants offer the first fruits, the ears of corn, howling and wailing about the handfuls they offer, invoking this god Isis. And this they do in return of due honor to her, that invention at the first. In some cities, when they celebrate the feast of Isis in a pompous procession, they carry out vessels of wheat and barley in memory of the first invention by the care and industry of this goddess. They say likewise that Isis made many laws for the good of human society, whereby were strained from lawless force, violence, one upon another, out of fear of punishment. And therefore, Ceres was called by the ancient Greeks Themophorus, that is, lawgiver, being the princess that first constituted laws for the better government of her people. Osiris, moreover, built Thebes in Egypt, the hundred gates, and called it after his mother's name. But in following times, it was called Diospolis and Thebes, of whose first founder, not only historians, but the priests of Egypt themselves, are much in doubt. For some say it was not built by Osiris, but by many years after by a king of Egypt, whose history we shall treat hereafter in its proper place. They report, likewise, that he built two magnificent temples and dedicated to his parents, Jupiter and Juno, and likewise two golden altars, the greater to the great god Jupiter, the other to his father Saturn, who had formerly reigned there, whom they call Amon, that he has erected golden altars to other gods and instituted their several rites of worship and appointed priests to have the oversight and care of the holy things. In the time of Osiris and Isis, projectors and ingenious artists were in great honor and esteem, that therefore in Thebes there were the goldsmiths and braziers who made arms and weapons for the killing of wild beasts and other instruments for the husbanding of the ground and improvement of tillage besides images of the gods and the altars and gold they say that osiris was much given to husbandry and that he was the son of jupiter brought up by nisa a town of arabia the happy near to egypt called by the greeks dionysus from his father and the place of his education. The poet in his hymns makes mention of Nisa as bordering upon Egypt, where he says, Far off from Phoenicia stands the sacred Nisa, where streams of Egypt's Nile begins to rise on mountain high with pleasant wood adorned. Here, near unto Nisa, they say he found out the use of the vine and there planting it was the first that drank wine and taught others how to plant it and use it and to grasp in their vintage and keep and preserve it 
Above all others, he most honored Hermes, one of the admirable ingenuity and quick invention in finding out what might be useful to mankind. This Hermes was the first that taught how to speak distinctly and articulately and gave names to many things that had been known before. He found out letters and instituted the worship of the gods and was the first to observe the motion of the stars, invented music, taught the manner of wrestling, invented arithmetic, and the art of curious graving and cutting of statues. He first found out the harp with three strings in resemblance of the three seasons of the year, causing three several sounds, the treble, bass, and mean, the treble to represent the summer, the bass, the winter, and the mean, the spring. He was the first that taught the Greeks eloquence, thence he is called Hermes, a speaker or interpreter. To conclude, he was Osiris's sacred scribe, to whom he communicated all his secrets and was chiefly steered by his advice in everything. He, not Minerva as the Greeks affirm, found out the use of the olive tree for the making of holy oils. It is moreover reported that Osiris, being the prince of a public spirit and the very ambitious of glory, raised a great army with which he resolved to go through all parts of the world that were inhabited and to teach men how to plant vines and how to sow wheat and barley. For he hoped that if he could civilize men and take them off from their rude and beast-like courses of life, by such public good and advantage, he should raise a foundation amongst all mankind for his immortal praise and honor, which happened accordingly. For not only that age, but posterity, ever after honored those among the chiefest of their gods that first found out their proper and ordinary food. Having therefore settled his affairs in Egypt and committed the government of his whole kingdom to his wife Isis, he joined her with Thoth as her chief counselor of state. He far excelled others in wisdom and prudence. But Hercules, his near kinsman, he left general of all his forces within his dominions, a man admired for all his valor and strength of body. As to those parts which lay near Phoenicia and upon the sea coast of them, he made Busiris lord lieutenant of all Ethiopia, Libya, Antios. Then marching out of Egypt, he began his expedition, taking along with him his brother, whom the Greeks call Apollo. This Apollo is reported to have discovered the laurel tree, which all dedicate especially to this god, and wear diadems of laurel leaves. To Osiris they attribute the finding out of the ivy tree, and wear ivy diadems instead of laurel, and dedicate to him, who the Greeks call Bacchus. Therefore, in the Egyptian tongue, they call ivy Osiris's plant, which they prefer before the vine in all their sacrifices, because this loses its leaves, and the others always continue fresh and green, which rule the ancients have observed in other plants that are always green, dedicating myrtle to Venus, laurel to Apollo, olive to Pallas, and ivy to Osiris. It is said that two of his sons accompanied their father Osiris in his expedition, one called Anubis and the other Makado, both valiant men. Both of them wore coats of mail that were extraordinary, remarkable, covered with the skins of such creatures as resembled them in stoutness and valor. Anubis was covered with the dogs and Makado with the skin of a wolf. And for this reason, these beasts are religiously adored by the Egyptians. He had likewise for his companion Pan, whom the Egyptians have in great veneration. For they not only set up images and statues in every temple, 
but built a city in Thebides after his name called by the inhabitants Chaman, which by interpretation is Pan City. There went along with them, likewise, those that were skillful in husbandry, as marrow in the planting of vines, and triptolemus in sowing of corn, gathering the harvest. All things being prepared now, Osiris, having vowed to the gods to let his hair grow till he returned into Egypt, marched through Ethiopia. And for that very reason, it is a piece of religion and practice among the Egyptians this very day. And those that travel abroad suffer their hair to grow till they return home. As he passed through Ethiopia, a company of satyrs were presented to him, who, as it is reported, were all hairy down to their loins. For Osiris was a man given to mirth and jollity, and took great pleasure in music and dancing, and therefore carried along with him a train of musicians, of whom nine were virgins, most excellent singers and experts, and many other things, who the Greeks call the Muses, whom Apollo was the captain the brother of Osiris, who is then called the leader of the Muses. Upon this account, the setters, who are naturally inclined to skipping and dancing and singing and all other sorts of mirth, were taken in as part of the army. For Osiris was not for war, nor came to fight battles and to decide controversies by the sword, every country receiving him for his merits and virtues as a god. In Ethiopia, having instructed the inhabitants in husbandry and tillage of the ground, and built several cities among them, he left there behind some of the governors of the country and others to be the gatherers of his tribute. While they were thus employed, it is said that the river Nile, above the dog days, at which time it uses to be the highest, broke down its banks and overflowed the greatest part of Egypt, and that part especially where Prometheus was the governor, insomuch as almost all the inhabitants were drowned, so that Prometheus was near unto killing himself for the grief of heart, and from the sudden and violent eruption of the waters the river was called Eagle. Hercules who was always high in difficult enterprises, an ever a stout spirit, presently made up breaches and turned the river into its channel and kept it within the ancient banks. And therefore, some of the Greek poets from this fact have forged a fable that Hercules killed the eagle that fled upon Prometheus's heart. The most ancient name of this river was Oceanus, which in the Greek pronunciation Okeanus, afterwards called Eagle, upon the violent eruption. Lastly, it was called Egyptus, from the name of a king that reigned there, which the poets attest who says, In the river of Egyptus, then I placed the galley swift. For near Thonis, as it is called, an ancient marked town of Egypt, the river empties itself into the sea. The last name, which still remains, derives from Nilus, a king of those parts. Osiris, being come to the borders of Ethiopia, raised high banks on either side of the river, lest in time of its inuition, it should overflow the country more than was convenient, and make it marsh and boggy and made floodgates to let the water by degrees, as far as was necessary. Thence he passed through Arabia, bordering upon the Red Sea, as far as to India, and the utmost coasts that were inhabited. He built likewise many cities in India, one which he called Nisa, willing to have remembrance of that of Egypt, where he was brought up. At this Nisa in India, 
he planted ivy, which grows and remains here only for all other places in India, or the parts adjacent. He left, likewise, many other marks of his being in those parts, by which the later, inter by which the later inhabitants are induced to believe and to affirm that this god was born in India. He likewise addicted himself much to hunting of elephants and took care to have statues of himself in every place and lasting monuments of his expedition. Thence, passing the rest of Asia, he transported his army through the Hellespont into Europe. And in Thrace, he killed Lycurgus, the king of the barbarians, who opposed him in his designs. Then he ordered Maro, at the time of an old man, to take care of the planters in that country and build a city and call it Marines, after his own name. Makado, his son, he made king of Macedonia, so calling it after him. To Triptolus, he appointed a culture and tillage of the land of Attica. To conclude, Osiris having traveled through the whole world by finding out food fit and convenient for man's body, was a benefactor to all mankind. Where vines would not grow and be fruitful, he taught the inhabitants to make drink of barley. He brought back with him into Egypt the most precious and richest things that every place did afford, and for the many benefits and advantages by the common consent of all men, he gained the reward of immortality and honor equal to the heavenly deities. The story of Osiris' death is as follows. Seth invited Osiris to a banquet with some of Seth's wicked friends. After the feasting, a casket was carried in. A gift from Seth to anyone who could fit inside. Seth's friends tried in vain to squeeze, stretch, or slide themselves in the casket. None of them fit. Then Osiris took his turn and fit perfectly in the casket. In a flash, Seth slammed down the lid and sealed it shut. The coffin was then thrown into the Nile. It floated off toward the sea. Isis was heartbroken at the loss of her husband. Isis was pregnant at this time with Horus. Leaving her baby son behind with Hermes, she set out to find Osiris' body. After many weeks, Isis reached the city of Byblos in Phoenicia. With the help of her magic, she discovered Osiris' coffin with a great ivy tree growing from the coffin. She hurried back to Egypt, but before she could place Iris in his tomb, she, Seth found the body. He chopped his brother into 14 pieces and scattered them across the land of Egypt. Isis set out once again to search for the pieces of Osiris' body. After weeks of searching, she found all but one part of Osiris' body, his phallus, which had been swallowed up by a fish. To protect Osiris from Seth, Isis buried Osiris in 13 different places. The spirit of Osiris passed into the underworld where he became the king of Hades. Osiris transmigrated his soul into his son, Horus, the birth of Horus, the avenger of the father, was seen by some as a resurrection of Osiris. Seth became Pharaoh of Egypt One day when Horus was just a child, Seth took on the shape of a scorpion, came into Horus's room, and stung him and killed him. Horus was then sent to the underworld with his father, where he would stay there until he was of age, so he can avenge his father. And when he was of age, Amun, the father of Osiris, the ruler and creator of the universe, took Horus and brought him back to the land of the living by the sacred boat. 
Seth was already waiting for his return, charged at Horus and aimed fire at his eyes and blinded him. After many weeks, Horus regained his sight. Horus gathered the great army and chased down Seth up the river Nile, where they reached the island of Elephantine. Horus saw Seth standing there in the form of a vast red hippopotamus, uttering a terrible curse. Horus threw with much force a javelin in the roof of Seth's mouth and into his brain. The red hippopotamus sank dead into the Nile. The darkness vanished and the people of Egypt rejoice of the victory of Horus, son of Osiris, the Avenger. Peace came to Egypt and Horus was crowned Pharaoh. Now after the death of Osiris, Isis and Hermes celebrated his funeral with sacrifices and other divine honors as to one of the gods and instituted many sacred rites and mystical ceremonies in memory of the mighty works wrought by his hero, now deified. Anciently, the Egyptian priests kept the manner of the death of Osiris secret in their own registers among themselves. But in after times, it fell out that some that could not hold blurted it out, the secret mysteries of Osiris. And so it came abroad, for they say that Osiris, while he governed Egypt, with all justice imaginable, murdered by his brother, who was known as Typhon to the Greeks, and that he mangled his body into six and twenty pieces and gave to each of his confederates in the treason a piece. By that means bring them all within the same horrid guilt, and thereby the more to engage them, advance him to the throne, and defend and preserve in the possession. But Isis, with the assistance of her son Horus, avenged the death of Osiris and got revenge upon Seth and his accomplices and possessed herself of the kingdom of Egypt. It is said that the battle was fought near a river, not far off a town, now called Antia in Arabia, as so called from Antaeus, whom Hercules slew in the time of Osiris. She found all the pieces of his body, except for the phallus. And having a desire to conceal her husband's burial, yet to have him honored by a god, by all Egyptians, she thus contrived it. She closed all the pieces together, cementing them with wax and aromatic spices, and so that to the shape of a man, of the bigness of Osiris, she sent for the priests to her, one by one, and swore them all that they should not discover what she should then entrust them with. Then she told them privately that they only should have the burial of the king's body, and recounting the many good works he had done, charged them to bury the body in proper place among themselves and to pay unto all the divine honor as to God, that they should dedicate to him one of the beasts bred among them, which of them they pleased that it was alive. They should pay it with some veneration as they did before Osiris himself. And when it was dead, they should worship it with the same adoration and worship given to Osiris. But being willing to encourage the priests that these divine offices by profit and advantage she gave them a third part of the country for maintenance of service of the god and their attendance at the altars in memory therefore of osiris's great deeds being incited there unto the commands of the queen and in expectation of their own profit and advantage the priests exactly performed everything that Isis enjoined them, and therefore every order of the priests at this day are of opinion that Osiris is buried among them, and they have those beasts in great veneration that were so long since thus consecrated and renewed their mournings for Osiris, the weeping for the dead god over the graves of those beasts. There are two sacred bulls, especially the bull Apis and the other Menevis, that are consecrated to Osiris and reputed as gods generally all by Egyptians. 
for this creature of all others was extraordinary, serviceable to the first inventors of husbandry, both as to sowing corn and the other advantages concerning tillage of which all reaped the benefit. Lastly, they say that after the death of Osiris, Isis made a vow never to marry another man and spent the rest of her days in exact administration of justice among her subjects, excelling all other princes in her acts of grace and bounty towards her people. And therefore, after her death, she was numbered among the gods, and as such had divine honor and veneration, and was buried at Memphis, where they show her sepulture at this day in the grove of Vulcan. Yet, there are some that deny that these gods are buried in Memphis, but near the mountains of Ethiopia and Egypt and the Isle of the Nile, lying near a place called Phylus, and upon the account also called the Holy Field, they confirm this by undoubted signs and marks left in the island, as a sepulcher built and erected to Osiris, religiously reverenced by all the priests of Egypt, wherein are laid up three hundred and three score bulls, which certain priests appointed for that purpose fill every day with milk and call upon the gods by name, with mourning and lamentation. For the cause, none go into the island except the priests. The inhabitants of Thebes, which is the most ancient city of Egypt, account as great oath, and by no means to be violated. If a man swear by Osiris, that lies buried at Philae. The several parts, therefore, of Osiris being found, they report were buried in this manner before related. His privy members, they say, were thrown into the river by Typhon because none of his partners would receive them, and yet that they were divinely honored by Isis, for she commanded an image of this very part to be set up in the temples and to be religiously adored, and in all their ceremonies and sacrifices to this god, she ordered that part to be held in divine veneration and honor, and therefore, Grecians, after they learned the rites and ceremonies of the feast of Bacchus, and the origin, Solentes, the Egyptians, and all their mysteries and sacrifices to this god, they adored the member of the phallus, and the growing of corn is the growing of the phallus of Osiris. From Osiris and Isis to reign of Alexander the Great, who built a city after his own name, the Egyptian priests reckon above 10,000 years. They affirm that those that say this god Osiris was born at Thebes in Boethia of Jupiter and Semele relate that which is false. For they say that Orpheus, after he came into Egypt, was initiated into the sacred mysteries of Bacchus or Dionysus, and being special friend to the Thebans in Boethia, and of great esteem among them, to manifest his gratitude, transferred the birth of Bacchus or Osiris over into Greece, and the common people, partly out of ignorance and partly out of desire they had about this god, should be a Greek, readily received these mysteries and sacred rites among them, and that Orpheus took the occasion following to fix the birth of the god and his rites and ceremonies among the Greeks, and thus Cadmus, they say, was born at Thebes in Egypt, and amongst other children begat Semele, that she was got with child by one unknown and was delivered at seven months' end of a child very like to Osiris, as the Egyptians describe him. But such births are not used to live, either because it is not the pleasure of the gods it should be, or that the law of nature will not admit it. Semele was not with a man, and was miraculously pregnant with Dionysus, who the Egyptians know as Osiris. This is the second birth of Osiris, the matter coming to Cadmus, being before warned by the oracle to protect the laws of his country. He wrapped the infant in gold and situated sacrifices to be offered to him, 
as if Osiris had appeared again in this shape and caused it to be spread abroad, that it was begotten of Jupiter, thereby both to honor Osiris and to cover his daughter's shame, and therefore it is a common report among the Greeks that Semele, the daughter of Cadmus, was with child by no other than Jupiter, and by him had Osiris. In after times, Orpheus, by reason of his excellent art and skill in music, and knowledge in theology, and institution of sacred rites and sacrifices to the gods, was greatly esteemed among the Greeks, and especially was received and entertained by the Thebans, and by them highly honored above all others, who being excellently learned in the Egyptian theology, brought down to the birth of the ancient Osiris to a far later time, and to gratify the Cadmeans or Thebans, instituted new rites and ceremonies at which he ordered that it should be declared to all that were admitted to those mysteries that Dionysus or Osiris was begotten by a virgin Semele by Jupiter. The people therefore partly through ignorance and partly by being deceived with their dazzling lust of Orpheus reputation and with their good opinion of his truth and faithfulness in this matter, especially to have this god reputed a Greek being to the use to these rites as it before declared. And with these stories, the mythologists and poets have filled all the theaters, and now it is generally received as truth. Not in the least to be questioned, to conclude the presay that the Greeks have arrogated themselves, both their gods and demigods, or heroes, and say that the divers colonies were transported over to them out of Egypt, for Hercules was an Egyptian, and by his valor made his way into most parts of the world and set up a pillar in Africa, and this they endeavor to make proof that the Greeks themselves. For whereas it is owned by all that Hercules assisted the gods in the giant's war, it is plain that at the time when the Greeks say Hercules was born, the earth had not then the strength to produce giants, neither were there any in those days, that is to say, in the next before the Trojan War, but rather as Egyptians affirm, the first generation beginning of mankind from which the Egyptians account above 10,000 years. But the Trojan War, not 1200, and according to this computation of the Egyptians, a club and lion skin may agree well enough with the ancient Hercules, for the use of arms not being at the time found out, men fought with clubs and staves and covered their bodies with beasts of skins, with skins of beasts. This ancient Hercules, they say, was the son of Jupiter, but no, not who was mother. He who was the son of Alcamena, they affirm, was born above 10,000 years after the other and was called at first Alcaeus, but afterwards Heracles. Not that he had honorable surname from Juno, as Matris says, but assumed to himself the name of emulation, desirous to do as great as the ancient Hercules, and so to inherit as well his fame and glory as his name. Moreover, the Greeks have very ancient tradition, which agrees with the Egyptians that Hercules freed the earth from wild beasts, which cannot possibly be applied to him who flourished about the time of the Trojans, when most parts of the world were free from such annoyances by improvement of lands and multitudes of populous cities, by the reduction of the world to a more civil course of living, agrees best with ancient Hercules. When men were yet vexed and plagued with wild beasts, and especially in Egypt, whose upper part is wilderness and full of wild beasts at this very day, and it is but very reasonable to think that Hercules should mind the prosperity, the prosperity and welfare of Egypt in his own country and free the land from wild beasts and so deliver it into the hands of husbandmen and improve by tillage that upon his account was honored as a god. The report likewise that Perseus was born in Egypt 
and that the Greeks say, transferred from thence the birth of Isis into Argos, inventing a story that she was the same with Io, who was metamorphosized into a bull. And indeed, there are great differences and disputes discerning these gods, for some call the same god as Isis, others call her Ceres, some Themosphorus, others Luna, others Juno, and some other names like the Great Mother and Demeter. They term Osiris sometimes with Serapis, sometimes Dionysus, sometimes Pluto, and also Amon, sometimes Jupiter, often Pan. There are some likewise that say Serapis is the same as the Greek Pluto. Also some who identify Ashmun, the Phoenician god, as Osiris, or Baal. The Egyptians report that Isis found many medicines for the recovery of men's health, being very expert in the art of physic and contrived many remedies for that purpose. And therefore, even now, when she is advanced to an immortal state, she takes pleasure in curing men's bodies, and that those that desire her assistance in their sleep can clearly manifest her presence and affords ready and effectual relief to them that stand in need of it. For clear proof of all this, they say, they have not only usual fables of the Greeks, but the undoubted evidence, and that almost the whole world bears testimony to this, by the respect and honor they pay to this goddess, the account of her great fame in curing diseases. For in sleep she is present with persons and applies remedies to the sick, and wonderfully cures those that are her votaries that many that have been given up by the physicians are incurable, have been restored by Isis, and that many who have been blind and lame were restored by Isis. Many who have sought to her help have been perfectly restored to their former sight and soundness of body. They say that she found out a medicine that would raise the dead to life. The Sumerians tell a story about Isis and Osiris and Isis going down into the underworld, bringing Osiris up and raising the dead among them at the spring equinox. She not only raised her son Horus that was killed by the Titans and found dead in the water, but that the application made him immortal. This Horus was the last of the gods that reigned in Egypt after the translation of Osiris his father. This Horus, they say, by interpretation is Apollo, who being taught by his mother Isis the art of psychic and divination and very beneficial to mankind in these respects. The Egyptian priests in their computation of time do reckon above three and 20,000 years for the reign of Sol to the passage of Alexander the Great into Asia. In their fabulous stories, they say, the most ancient of their gods reigned 1,200 years, and the latter no less than 300 years apiece. Whereas this great number of years seems incredible, some have not stuck to affirm that the motion of the sun, not being then known, the year was reckoned according to the course of the moon, and therefore the solar year, consisting then but of 300 days, some of them were sure to live 1200 lunar years. And even in this day now, that there are 12 months in the year, many live 100 solar years. The like they say of them that reign 300 years, for in their time they say, the year was made up of four months, every four applicable to each of the three seasons. Of the solar years, that is to say, spring, summer, and winter, which is the reason that some of the Greeks call the year Horus. Seasons and historical annals, horography. The Egyptians, moreover, among their fables report 
that it is the fame of Isis, there were men of vast bodies, whom the Greeks called giants, and whom they place in their temples, prodigious shapes, who were whipped and scourged by them that sacrificed to Osiris. Some idly give forth that they sprang from the earth, when at first being the living creatures. Others report that from many extraordinary things done by men of strong bodies, the fables and stories of giants arose, but in the most degree that for the war they raised against the gods, Jupiter and Osiris, they were all destroyed. It was a law likewise, they say, in Egypt, against the caution of other nations, the brothers and sisters might marry one another, which accordingly was preposterous and successful in the marriage of Isis, who married her brother Osiris, and after his death made a vow never to marry another man, and after she had revenged her husband's death upon his murderers, she governed the kingdom and reigned justly all her days and did good universally to all sorts of people, obliging them with many and extraordinary benefits and advantages. And for her sake, it is a custom among them that they honor a queen and allow her more power, authority than a king. And in their contracts of marriage, authority is given to the wife over her husband, at which time the husbands promise to be obedient in their wives in all things. Isis was buried at Memphis, where at this day her shrine is to be seen in the grove of Vulcan. Although some affirm that these gods lie buried in the Nile at Phyllis, as said before, neither am I ignorant that some writers say their sepulchres are at Nisa in Arabia, whence Dionysus is called Nisaeus, where they say a pillar is erected to each of these deities with inscriptions and sacred letters upon them, and one which that belonging to Isis are these words. I am Isis, queen of all this country, scholar of Mercury. What laws I have made, none ought to disannul. I am the eldest, daughter of the youngest god, Saturn. I am the wife and sister of King Osiris. I am she that first found out corn for man's use. I am the mother of King Horus. I am she that arises in the dog star. The city of Bubastis was built in memory of me. Farewell. Rejoice, O Egypt. That was my nurse that brought me up. Upon Osiris's pillar, there are these that follow. My father was Saturn, the youngest of all the gods. I am Osiris that led an army through all the nations as far as the deserts of India, and in the countries lying to the north as far as to the head, springs of the river Ister, and the other parts as far as the ocean. I am the eldest firstborn son of Saturn, a branch of a famous noble stock, cousin, German to the day, there is not a place in the world where I have not been, and what I have discovered, I have imparted to all. So much of the inscriptions on the pillars, they say, may be read, the rest is defaced and worn out through the length of time. Thus, therefore, many disagree concerning the sepulchres of these gods, because the priests who were secretly instructed in the perfect knowledge of these matters would not suffer them to be spread abroad out of fear of these punishments that such were liable unto who revealed the secrets of the gods. They reported that afterwards many colonies out of Egypt were dispersed over all parts of the world, that Belus, who was taken up to be the son of Neptune and Libra, led a colony into the province of Babylon, having fixing his seat at the river Euphrates consecrated priests and according to the custom of the Egyptians, freed 
from all public taxes and impositions. These priests, the Babylonians call Chaldeans, who observe the motions of the stars, an imitation of the priests, naturalist astrologers of Egypt, that Danaeus likewise, from thence another colony, planted them in Argos, the most ancient city of all Greece, and that the people of Colchos and Pontus and the Jews lying between Arabia and Syria were colonies of Egypt, and that therefore it is ancient custom among these nations to circumcise all their male children after the rites and customs received from the Egyptians, that the Athenians likewise are a colony of the saints which came out of Egypt and our kindred they endeavor to prove by these arguments that is to say that only of all the Greeks call the city Asotu from Asotu a city among these people of the saints and that for the better government of the commonwealth they divide their people into the same ranks and degrees as they do in Egypt to wit into three orders the first they call Eupatride, employed for the most part in studying liberal arts and sciences and are advanced in the highest offices and places of performance and state as the priests of Egypt are. The second order of men are the rustic and country people who are the soldiers and take up arms upon occasions for the defense of the country. Like to those who are called husbandmen in Egypt who furnish out soldiers there and the third rank are reckoned tradesmen and artificers, who commonly bore all the necessary and public offices, which agrees exactly with the orders among usage of the Egyptians. They say likewise that there are some Athenian generals that came out of Egypt, for they affirm that Petios, the father of Menetheus, was captain in the Trojan War, an Egyptian, and afterwards a king of Athens. The Athenians had not wit enough to find out the true reason why two natures were ascribed to him. For every man knows that he was called half beast, that is half man, half beast. And the true ground was because he was a member of two several commonwealths, Greek and barbarian. Erechtheus, likewise, one of the kings of Athens, they say, was an Egyptian, which they prove by these arguments, that whereas there was a great drought, as all confess, almost over all the world except Egypt only, because of a peculiar property of the place, which destroyed both men and the fruits of the earth together, Erechtheus transported a great quantity of corn to Athens out of Egypt, because they and the Egyptians were of the same kindred, which the kindness of the citizens were so affected that they advanced him into the kingdom, which after he instituted the festivals and taught the Egyptian rites and mysteries of Demeter, Eleusinia. They say, moreover, that it is reported upon good ground that the goddess herself came into Attica at the time when corn and other good fruit and her name were transported thither and that therefore it seemed as if she had again renewed the invention of seed. She did at the beginning. Likewise, the Athenians themselves confess that in the reign of Erechtheus, when the drought had burnt up all the fruits of the earth, Ceres came thither and gave them corn, and that the rites and mysteries of this goddess were then begun in Eleusinia, and the sacrifices of ancient ceremonies both of the Athenians and Egyptians are one and the same, and that they took their original from the Ampelide of the Egyptian priests, and their heralds from the Pastori. Further, that only the Greeks swear by the name of Isis, and that in all their manners and customs they are altogether like the Egyptians. These and many other such like arguments bring and maintain this colony out of ambition because of the glory and renown of that city that any ground of truth they have for their assertion. To conclude, the Egyptians say 
that many parts of the world were planted by their ancestors, by colonies sent from thence, by means of the state and grandeur of their kings, and their vast number of their people, which reports not to being supported with sufficient arguments, nor attested by credible authors, we think them not worthy of any further account, but this much we thought fit to say of Egyptian theology.